lecture this evening are Dr. Peggy Albers, um, who initiated these, um, this series of talks along with Georgia State University, and myself. Um, I am Nicole Maxwell, a doctoral student at Georgia State University. Um, the purpose behind these, these talks um, is to share some cutting edge research with everyone um, in the field of literacy and language arts. Um, and we're hoping to reach people throughout the world. Um, if anyone has any interest in presenting um, as a part of this series, please contact Dr. Albers. And you can find her information at the, um, at the bottom part of this slide. Now I'd like to take a moment for everyone to show us. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Albers. I see that I can do that now. Um, I want to take a moment and show um, where everybody is coming from, either right now or perhaps where you're from. So if you would choose the wand tool um, just to the left of this map and, and um, show us where you are. Great. It's wonderful to see people coming from all different parts of the, the U.S. Just to give you an idea um, of, of how this is going to go, if you have any comments, um, you, can chat, you can type those in the chat area on the left side. And um, as our presenters have the opportunity or fits into their talk, then they will um, address those. If you have any questions, you can also type those in the chat area. Um, or underneath the list of participants is a little button that has a hand on it. And if you'll click that one time, that will let them know that you have a question. And Dr. Albers and I will keep an eye on that to um, help bring their attention to that as they go. Um, now to introduce you to our presenters for this evening, we have Dr. Jerry Harsty, who is well known um, Oops. Um, with, we have, sorry, um, my, uh, I think, OK, it's still working. Um, we have Dr. Jerry Harsty joining us this evening, who is well known in the area of critical literacy. He has, um, he's, has numerous affiliations, including the Whole Language Umbrella and the National Conference on Research in Language and Literacy. He also has many publications, um, some of which include Creating Critical Classrooms and Beyond Reading and Writing. And one of my favorite quotes um, of his that I have found is, we need to teach in such a way that students enjoy literature and at the same time come to see that language is never innocent. So we'd like to welcome um, Dr. Harsky tonight. And our second presenter for the evening is Dr. Vivian Vasquez from the American University. Um, and she is also well known in the area of critical literacy. Um, she also has multiple publications, including Negotiating Critical Literacies with Young Children and Literacy as Social Practice. Um, one of my favorite quotes of hers is, when curriculum is negotiated using the social worlds of children, learning is sustained and generative. And now we have our presentation from Dr. Harsty and Dr. Vasquez. Let's give them a virtual round of applause and welcome them. Well, it's my pleasure to join this conversation. I thank you all for coming and uh, for listening. Uh, our topic tonight is what do we mean by literacy now, critical, critical, critical curricular education. Vivian, do you want to say hi to the group, too? Hello, everyone. It's so good to see so many familiar names and uh, some new names out there as well. Thank you for joining us um, this evening. Uh, I'm going to start with the language story. This is uh, these four heads in the in the picture over here are my grandchildren, and I spent the summer at Myrtle Beach, part of which they came to join me. And this little uh, the little uh, princess is uh, one of, is Ella. She's the one that's in the back in the water, and uh, she's going into first grade. And I thought I'd start by. Uh, 
by coming clean. That is, I already had traumatized one first grader for uh, this school year. Um, part of getting ready for the summer, I bought myself this really zippy swimsuit, and it had a little uh, uh, snap, and it had a zipper, and the whole thing was lined, and it was really great. At any rate, Jason and that's my son and Ella were out in the water, and I walked out into the water, and the first wave took the bathing suit right down to my ankles. The second wave knocked me over. The third wave, I was floundering around, and Jason, uh, of course, was hanging on to Ella also and came and saved me. And so when we got this whole fiasco uh, done with, I, Ella got off. Uh, Jason met Ella down on the beach, and she re immediately ran over to Janice, her, uh, my wife, and she said, oh, Grandpa lost his bathing suit. And my wife said, oh, did you see his big white button? And she said, oh, I saw his private parts, too. And uh, Janice said, well, you're just going to have to try to keep it out of your mind. And she says, oh, I've been trying and trying, but I just can't get it out of my mind. <laughs> so that's my little language story for today. I'm hoping that your school year starts off a little bit better than that one. We wanted to talk about uh, what we think uh, Vivian and I sort of see as the major components of the curriculum um, and from a critical perspective. So uh, in some ways, critical literacy is the lens by which we look at other components of literacy. And I still sort of, uh, I, my, the formula or the, or the the structure that I like to think about curriculum is one, a block that really focuses on meaning making, another block that focuses on language and semiotic study, and a third block that really focuses on inquiry, all done from a critical kind of perspective. So we're going to be talking about that today. One of the things you want to do in critical literacy is you want to help kids understand that the, there are larger systems of meaning that are really positioning them as readers and as literate beings in society. And one of the books that I found that's just wonderful is this, I'm glad I'm a boy, I'm glad I'm a girl. Some of you I know, seeing the names on the list over here, I know that you've seen this, but if you, if you haven't, you should just drop me a note and I'll gladly send you a copy. This book happens to be out of print, but I share it quite frequently anyway. So what I wanted to do is just sort of start uh, by having sort of a read aloud. So while I can't hear you, I'm assuming that you'll, the boys will read the boys' part and the girls will read the girls' part. So it's, I'm glad I'm a boy, I'm glad I'm a girl. Boys have trucks, girls have dolls. Boys are Cub Scouts, girls are brownies. Boys are strong, girls are graceful. Boys are handsome, girls are beautiful. Boys are doctors, girls are nurses. Boys are policemen, girls are meter maids. Boys are football players, girls are cheerleaders. Boys are pilots, girls are stewardesses. Boys are heroes, girls are heroines. Boys are presidents, girls are first ladies. Boys fix things, girls need things fixed. Boys can eat, girls can cook. Boys invent things, girls use what boys invent. I'm sure you love this, Yetta. Build, boys build houses, girls keep houses. Boys are grooms, girls are brides. Boys are fathers, girls are mothers. I'm glad you're a girl. I'm glad you're a boy. We need each other. Ah, I guess one of the things that I really like about that, uh, about this particular book, is that uh, when you're talking about uh, helping kids look beyond, underneath the text, look at sort of the 
uh, the attitudes that are positioning you or the systems of meaning that operate in society position you, this book sort of brings that point uh, really clear. In actual fact, I've used it with first graders and I've used it with graduate students uh, and I've even used it with undergraduates with great success. They really sort of understand what it is that you're trying to do is unpack those systems of meaning. Uh, so it's a wonderful little resource. I said to uh, I, I said to my wife, I just love this little book, and she said, Jerry Harsky, how can you say you love that little book? And I, she has a good point. I mean, uh, uh, I don't love the little book for the message. I love the little book because it makes obvious the sort of the instructional mode uh, the, or the, the idea that I'm trying to get across. Uh, Vivian and I had talked about this presentation and she asked uh, and we sort of decided that I'd start and then uh, Vivian would ju uh, jump in at various points uh, and uh, we'd switch back and forth. But we wanted to start with just making some general observations about curriculum. And one of the things uh, that we wanted to say was that we see curriculum as a metaphor for the lives we want to live and the people we want to be. And um, I like that definition uh, because I think what it really says is that you've got to imagine what kind of world do you want to create and what kind of people do you want to be in that world. I think uh, Yetta Goodman often talks about, uh, you know, taking uh, terms back. And I, curriculum is one of those terms I think we have to take back. Curriculum, from my vantage point, is just too important to be given over to those who rarely come in contact with children. Uh, their notions of curriculum is sort of this paper document that they write in the abstract. Uh, I like to sort of think about uh, curriculum in three different ways, that, that there's this paper curriculum and then there's your attempt to enact uh, that paper curriculum, which is the enacted curriculum. And then I think the really important curriculum is the tr mental trip that the kids take. And as a teacher, I think what you have to really be concerned with is keeping your eye on that mental trip that kids are taking because you can very easily delude yourself into thinking that you're being successful and doing the kinds of things you want to do and the kids are taking a very different kinds of trip. I think, uh, you know, when you look at reading instruction, so much of the old way we used to teach reading uh, and in actual fact it's being advocated by the government, by state departments right now, kids end up hating reading as much as, as it's a better chance that they they'd end up hating reading than loving it. Um, and, I, and I guess I wanted to also start that way because I think it's important for you to remember, for all of us to remember, that as a teacher you really have to be a philosopher. You have to take it upon yourself to look at what kind of world you want to create, what kind of people you want to be, and then I say what, what the task of curriculum is, is to try to set up your classroom so that you're living, you're having that kind of live-through experience. I love uh, Louise Rosenbell's notion of a live-through kind of curriculum. Um, I think the other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that in the final analysis, the decisions we make about literacy are really ethical decisions, and I think we have to take responsibility for those <coughs> decisions. So let's uh, talk about these three components, meaning making. Um, the components that I see sort of as entailed in meaning making is writer's workshop where kids have lots of time to uh, for uninterrupted writing. Uh, uh, I also think a great uh, a read aloud program is essential, especially I, really all the way across the curriculum. I, uh, the research really suggests that at least uh, 15 minutes of reading is supportive of everybody's growth in reading, even if you use really uh, tight standards. Uh, but I think if you have to start someplace to shape up your our literacy program, I think starting with a read along program and using, I think, social issue books, books that raise really important social issues and open it up for conversation uh, goes a long way. I think the secret in both reading and writing is to get kids to hear, to get kids to trust 
that you want to hear what's on their mind. I think once you've really uh, got kids expressing what they're really thinking about, you're off to having great conversations over books, and I think you're off to a great writing program. Uh, I also uh, believe a lot in literature studies or literature circles, that is, uh, not only reading widely, but also reading intensely. Uh, and I still am a strong advocate of, re of strategy lessons. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want those to overtake the whole curriculum, but I think those, the kinds of strategies that proficient readers use ought to be shared with kids, and uh, they ought to be invited to try those particular strategies on. And then I'm, uh, I think the more we understand about literacy, the more we understand that uh, there's lots of different forms of literacy. And I think one of the things we have to be doing in the meaning-making section of our curriculum is just really opening up the multiple ways of knowing and bringing in the arts into our curriculum. I also think that, you know, the arts really put a new edge on the curriculum and make it exciting. So I'm a strong advocate uh, of uh, multiple ways of knowing and uh, in the curriculum. Um, uh, one of the points I think that a lot of us have been making, and I think that uh, you, you really have to understand, is that no one really becomes literate without freeing them, seeing themselves in literacy. Yet a Goodman tells the story of this little kid she was working with, and his name was Michael, and he was reading a book where he came across uh, the character's name, Michael, and he was just stunned that Michael would appear in a book. But if, if books are so foreign to kids and if it doesn't touch their life state, uh, I think we don't have a chance of starting this literacy process. I think one of, we have to build off of what the kids are bringing to us. And kids have to see literacy as something that fits into their own life. Uh, uh, Rosen always said uh, that culture is too important to be left on the schoolhouse steps. And so often I think uh, a lot of the uh, administrative policies is got it's almost like you, you're not supposed to deal with the uh, diversity in your classroom. But I think from uh, uh, the standpoint of what we know in terms of curriculum, we have to be building curriculum from uh, the cultural uh, knowledge that kids are bringing. I brought a, uh, I put in these couple examples from the Center for Inquiry, a school that I worked with up in Indianapolis with teachers. And this is uh, uh, just some journal entries. I want to be a golfer when I grow up. They get $116,000 a game. And uh, I sort of uh, put in these examples because I, once kids start writing about what they're thinking about, I think you've got the the data by which you can begin critical conversations in the classrooms. I mean, why is it that golfers get $116,000 a game and teachers get paid so little? Uh, the thought that Tanya's wrote, last night was my birthday. We went to ice capades. That's her spelling. It cost forty-six dollars a ticket. I mean, if it cost this was a this was an inner city setting, and if it's costing forty-six dollars a ticket, obviously there's a lot of kids that aren't going to be invited to the birthday party. Uh, I, uh, the other thing that I would say about the teaching of reading is that you're not really so much teaching skills and strategies as you're developing that child's in-head model of reading. Uh, I think so often we get ourselves, uh, 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 we get thinking about other, uh, the wrong things, partly because of the kinds of pressures that are upon us, and we we want to cover the curriculum. But it isn't so matter that you've taught the kids all these things you know. You have to really be looking at what does the kid believe about the reading process, and what can I do to help him develop a more functional uh, model of reading. And uh, the other point is here, moving across sign systems, is not only generative, but positions one differently in the world. When I first started uh, talking about semiotics or movement across sign systems, I was really 
back in those early days thinking about that move as being cognitively generative. Uh, and I think since then, I think what I've come to understand is it isn't just, co there's really a sociological dimension too, that as you engage in the different art systems, you position yourself differently and people read themselves differently in the world. And I want those kinds of understandings not to just be underground, but understood. Um, another piece of advice I think is just to think uh, when you're planning curricular engagements to think about quality rather than quantity. So often um, I think we uh, try to cover too much and we don't really uh, linger in a particular curricular engagement. I, I really think kids learn more from a quality uh, engagement than they do from a lot of little chintzy engagements. And then uh, this is a plea for a good read aloud program around social issue books. I think uh, even if you don't uh, know all of the issues that kids are facing by uh, reading some of the social issue books that uh, we've been uh, uh, identifying and uh, and putting out in NCTE, uh, it opens up conversations and I think then uh, let the kids talk and build off those conversations. And if you bring in a book uh, on gangs and the kid and nobody talks about gangs, then move on to something else. But uh, I think your task is to sort of open up the field to talk about issues that, that uh, uh, the kids are having. All, uh, I threw this in because every now and then I hear, well, the kids I work with don't have language or the kids I work with don't have experience. And those questions I think really aggravate me the most. I, everybody has language and everybody has experience. In actual fact, I'd argue that you probably experience the world a lot better from the back of a pickup truck than you do from the back seat of a Volvo. Uh, I think what what uh, people who have this position are really saying is that the kids are coming to school not with the experience they wanted the kids to come. And I think we just have to get over that. We have to begin to build curriculum from what the experiences that the kids have and, they, and we have to value the language and the experiences that they bring to the classroom. And at this point, Vivian, I have talked enough. I'm turning it over to you. All right, so if you continue to think about what language study, what semiotic study means for literacy learning and teaching, especially nowadays, we need to keep in mind, of course, the sorts of new multi-literacies and multi-literacy practices of the children with whom we work. So in a world where images and other virtual modes are, are really overtaking print as the major vehicle of communication, it's no surprise that while playing in the yard at her sister's school, two-year-old Sienna, before sitting in a ride-on car like the one on the slide in front of you, turned around with her hand outstretched and said to her mother, keys. Her mother then handed her these play keys. And then she turned around again before getting into the car and once again reached out her hand in the direction of her mother and said, phone. And her mother then handed her her play phone. In another part of, of uh, the US, this is actually uh, um, Jerry's uh, grandson, Pete. And Jerry's daughter, Allison, posted on one of the social networking sites that one-year-old Pete's first words were, iPod and Chewbacca. So these kids are growing up in a very different world than, than we did. This is an image of, that's actually my son with a baseball cap when he was uh, four years old. And this was at his, um, his preschool. His teacher had asked the children to present on something with regards to their cultural background. So he decided he wanted to present on Canada. This I'm Canadian, he's, he's, you know, he's biracial. 
And so he decided that, you know, he had seen me putting together all, all kinds of PowerPoint slides and my husband putting together PowerPoint slides. So he decided he wanted to create a PowerPoint slide. So we worked with him when we put together this slide presentation. And so here he is, you know, in his classroom with three to five year olds talking about Canada um, and using these power, PowerPoint slides. And you can see from, you know, the, 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 his classmates sitting around that table how how they sort of really tuned in to what he's talking about. This is um, an image of a whiteboard at a uh, home of another Facebook friend who, I guess she has these whiteboards all over her house and one day you know, she noticed that her son, her six-year-old son, was posting, was writing these, these messages that were very similar to tweets. So if any of you are on Twitter, for instance, you know that you can only use, I think it's 140 characters to say what you have to say. And so AJ, you know, had become very attuned to this kind of tweet-like messaging. And so all over their house, he had all of these sort of tweets, but he had written them on the whiteboard. So here, for instance, he first wrote, time to go. And then they went wherever they were going. When he came back, he went back to the whiteboard and he wrote, we came back home. And then he left again and then he thought, oh, when did we come back? And he, you know, added to that message at 6.17. Then he left again, came back a bit later and wrote, I had a cup of milk. And then came back again, red milk. So she was saying, you know, it's just in so interesting how this world has really sort of taken on this space in her son's literacy world. This is AJ again when he was about seven. And, and this time, he's, obviously, he's wearing a dog costume. And what he had to say about this image is that, when you're online, nobody knows that you're a dog, which makes perfect sense. I mean, this is a really sophisticated um, concept, and a lot of kids actually get that, so they negotiate to construct particular images for themselves, particular identities online to be who they want to be, how they want to be. My son, again, in his preschool, was asked by his teacher, to, well, they were all asked to draw an image of their family. So this is the image that, that he drew. So that's TJ in the middle. And so when he brought this home, we said to him, oh, that's so interesting, you know, what do you want to tell us about it? And he said, oh, well, you know, this is the three of us. And we said, you know, well, there's something, we're holding something. And he said, oh, yeah, those are iPod touches. Now, at this point, we actually didn't ha each have an iPod touch. But in his ideal world, and so here we are with these iPod Touches. And so we said, oh, it's so interesting. There's different colors on the iPod Touches. And he said, well, of course, because we all have different interests. And so since we have different interests, we would have different apps or applications on our iPod Touches. So clearly, I mean, access to digital technologies in many parts of the world has changed the kinds of spaces and possibilities for literacy and really has contributed to the development of you know, all sorts of new literacy practices in which very young children can produce and reproduce identities and enter global online communities. I was noticing that people were saying, oh yeah, in the, in the chat over here, how oh, first graders can be doing this kind of work and so forth. But you know, I would argue that children even before first grade are able to engage in this kind of work. I mean, a lot of these children that I was talking about, you know, here in these slides, these are sort of, these are one and a half to six-year-old children doing some of this work. At the same time, the digital divide means that where in some homes very young children are able to manipulate and create text for touch screen smartphones, participate in massively multiplayer online games such as Lego Universe. Others remain without food, shelter, running water, and electricity. And so, I mean, in this way then, connectivity has become another class marker that produces differential access to the world. This is referred to by uh, Wu as the new black goal, which produces new and diverse forms of inclusion and exclusion. In a recent editorial that um, I did with Hillary Jenks, we suggested that we take these challenges along with the possibilities presented by the new communication landscape, new modes of meaning making, the ongoing transformation of digital text, the interactivity and immediacy of access, 
for some to the information highway and create new and exciting spaces to further explore critical literacy. So I mean, it's just so much easier to say, yeah, but there's a digital divide and so there's not much I can do about that than it is to ask, well, how can I continue to make sense of the social effects of textual practices, including those of the new digital age in which we live, to help young people to really understand the politics of semiosis and the textual instantiations of power that play, that play out through those texts. So these challenges, I mean, what Alan Luke refers to as sort of being part of that contemporary crisis, shouldn't minimize the need for doing the critical work. And, you know, I mean, Barbara Comer talks about this. All of this requires continual reinvention of critical literacies guided by ongoing analysis of the ways in which language and power are implicated in the lived politics of everyday life experienced by, you know, particular places in particular spaces. So what might this look like in the classroom? I was a co-op mom while well, I still am at my son's school. And one of the projects we took on was planting tomatoes. This is with five and six-year-olds. They became very interested in planting tomatoes after one of them saw this ad about the topsy-turvy tomato planter. So they became super interested in, you know, what was this about? Is this something we can do? So they started to look more closely at the ad. And they decided, you know, so then I said to them, well, what are some things that we can do to find out more about tomato planting? So some of the things they did, when they went to the library and, you know, looked at books, they looked it up online and they talked to people. They talked to family members and friends who were, who were growing tomatoes to see sort of what they had to say about what we needed to know, what we needed to do to grow these tomatoes. What we ended up doing is what you know, we referred to as the tomato trials. Is so what we did was we grew tomatoes from seeds. So we bought seeds and we planted those. We put plants, small tomato plants, in the ground. And then we also used a topsy-turvy tomato planter. So they had these three different ways of growing tomatoes that they were trying out. And so there's TJ and there's the, the seeds. Obviously, you can see that more in the center of the page, the little plants. And the topsy-turvy tomato planter is to the right. So here are just you know, some of the things that, that we did. Um, to read the topsy-turvy tomato planter, we did say something using art cards, which was, you know, just taking, this is a strategy that Jerry and I learned from Tanya Crosswell, a Canadian teacher, who focuses her work around art. And so what she suggested is you take all of these art cards, these postcards that you can buy at art museums and what have you, and just you know, you sort of just spread them out all over the, the tables in your classroom. and you get kids to choose art cards that represent their thinking, that represent their questions, that represent their understanding. It's a really nice way to help them to articulate what they're thinking about, what they want to say if they're having, especially if they're, ha they're struggling through doing that. So we did that. And then we took turns sharing one thing they noticed um, on the ad, the topsy-turvy, the box of the topsy-turvy tomato planter. And we made a list of all of these things on chart paper. And then we went back through the different items to talk about, you know, why do you think a particular item was included on the box? So why were certain words used? Why were certain images included? What other things should have been included that would have been informative for you? How do these items work to motivate you to read the ad in a certain way? How does it encourage you to buy the topsy-turvy tomato planter? Or, you know, what are some things on it that deter you from buying the topsy-turvy tomato planter? What does the ad want you to believe and why? How does it lead you to believe these things? And then there is also a video and all kinds of images online. So, you know, the other question was, you know, why include a video? What difference does it make to have the video? What difference does it make to have the, the photographs as opposed to just a, a print text-based ad? So these were just some of the things that we did to critically read the, um, the topsy-turvy tomato planter box and ad. Now, when we looked at the video, parts of the video were in 
black and white. Parts of the video were in color, and so that was something that the children really sort of noticed, is, you know, why are parts of it in color, why are parts of it in black and white, and what effects do these, col these changes in, in color have on how we read the video, how we take in the video, on how we consume the messages that they're sharing with us through these videos. And these are some particular images that caught their attention because the audio for this part of the of the video talked about tomato planting as backbreaking work. And mostly they talked about I mean you can see there's this man, you know, with his with his hoe and he's and you can see in the second image that he's grimacing and this is really, you know, backbreaking, painful work. And then in the bottom image, they now have a topsy-turvy tomato planter, and who do you see as part of this planting process, but all of a sudden there's a woman in the ad. And so they started to question this idea of backbreaking, backbreaking for whom? Now, you know, and, and then um, when Jerry and I were sharing this with a group of teachers, many of whom were from um, a community in Toronto where they, they did a lot of gardening, where, you know, culturally, this was for them very insulting. So it was very interesting in terms of culture and space and critical geography kind of work to think about what these kinds of ads and images and text mean from that perspective. So they really sort of found this very problematic and the gender sort of then came into play as, you know, it's backbreaking for women and that's why, you know, all of a sudden the topsy turvy tomato makes it not backbreaking work and so all of a sudden now you've got a woman as part of this ad. And from here, the um, the commercial actually shifts to color when now you've got this woman who's got this, this toffee turvy tomato planter that she's using that she can use because it's no longer, you know, backbreaking work. So they did lots of problematizing around that as well. So here are just, you know, some of the things that we had done. So we were growing the tomatoes. We were deconstructing and redesigning the video. So, you know, they started to come up with, you know, if they, if they were redesigning the video, what would they do differently? Um, you know, in terms of that whole issue around backbreaking, what are some different things they might do in terms of gender issues? What are some things that they might do differently? How might they represent, um, you know, Different, different people differently, and then taking up the issues of, of race as well as, as a possibility. Some other things also in terms of, you know, we're talking a little bit about technology here. What does technology afford the work that we do? So here is, this is this, this bundle of words in this tomato shape was created using, um, it's a free online tool called Tagzito, T-A-G-X-E-V-O. Basically, what you do is you go to different websites, and you can either type in text, and then you, know, you get it to create the image, and it'll it'll pull out the words that um, that appear. So, the, so, so that the more word appears, the bigger they are in this web of in this word cloud. So here, obviously, tomatoes was a word that appeared a lot in the particular website that we went to. This is the website on how to grow tomatoes that we went to. So basically what we did here is just to take the, the URL from the website, put it in Tagzito, and then click on, you know, create the image, and this is the image that was produced. So we can now look at this to say, right, so what are the things that were being highlighted in, on this particular web, web page? So it's a nice way of doing some, some, you know, quantitative and qualitative work research on these websites as a way of understanding how these sites are attempting to position us as readers and how we might want to read these, these sites in particular ways. So this is one website on how to plant tomatoes. And you can see highlighted is tomatoes, plant, garden, grow, greenhouse, compost. Um, and then this is one for the topsy-turvy tomato planter. And here you can see that the words in the word cloud are very different and the sizes of the words are very different. So here, you know, in large letters you have obviously turvy for topsy-turvy, order, um, planter, and then you've got guarantee. So very different words appear. And it's a really nice way then to, for children to be able to make these sort of comparisons to critically analyze these websites in a very visual way. 
So lots of those kinds of tools are now available online, and you know we need to think about how what kind of what kind of you know work these tools afford the critical literacies that we're attempting to create spaces for in our classrooms. So I'll just pass this on to Jerry now for a little bit. Um, well, that was wonderful. I always love your examples, Vivian. Uh, I think they really bring home the fact that, you know, literacy isn't something that you wait around to work with kids when they get older on, but it's really a perspective that you can take from the start. And it's incredible the kind of thinking and work that kids uh, certainly can do. I think that, you know, this, this particular image here or this slide, um, I think it's really important to remember that one of our goals is to create agents of text rather than victims of text. Um, I don't see uh, critical literacy necessarily as overtaking the state or the government. I think that in actual fact, kids have got to be critically literate in the 21st century just so they don't get duped by the credit cards or they don't get duped into a mortgage or I think they, if they get just taken care of. Uh, Colin Langshire in a speech to, up in Toronto when I was there uh, gave me this great quote. He said, uh, truth no longer exists. Uh, it's simply a matter these days of what story you spin. And I think in many ways that statement really captures a lot of uh, the current sort of ambiance of the world. And I think it also speaks to why it is that we have to really work with kids in uh, helping them understand that text is never neutral and that they have to interrogate them. Um, my own feeling is that consumerism is an issue that's just too important to be ignored. And it really offers wonderful opportunities uh, in the classroom to look at how uh, multimodal text works. I think we have to do a lot more with visual literacy than we ever have in the past. Um, but I do think we know a lot about the grammar of visual design. I think uh, Tress's work is a, is a framework that we can adapt to work, uh, to work with our kids on that they can understand. I also think G, G's work can be adapted for kids. And I think uh, uh, Lakoff's notion of frames is another important uh, sort of conceptual framework that we can work with kids on. Um, I'm not against language study, and uh, I just want language study to be much more extensive and a lot more interesting than it was in the past. I think in the past we tended to focus on phonics and grammar, all the really sort of moderately dull stuff in, in language and literacy. And I think what the researchers in the 21st century have really showed us is that there's an awful lot uh, of work that we can do uh, that is really exciting about language. I'm very glad to see um, that Peter Johnson is going to be speaking uh, in this particular series because he's done so much work looking at just the way we use our voices and the kinds of language we use and uh, uh, you know how that how the language you use really affects uh, what goes on in schools and how we can become much more effective. And I think that's uh, the same sort of conscious awareness of our talk. We have to become much more consciously aware of how the visual images in our world are positioning us in ways uh, that we may or may not want to be positioned. The third component uh, that uh, I think we, you need to focus on is inquiry. And I see inquiry as sort of using reading and writing um, to uh, explore your world. Um, I think inquiry is really one of the basic sorts of attitudes that have to undergird education. And I'll talk more about my notions of education as inquiry and inquiry as education a little later. I'm going to let Vivian sort of dive in here and talk about uh, her work with the audit trail and setting up a learning wall and really uh, an inquiry-based curriculum in the classroom and how such a curriculum might evolve and yet be visible enough to share 
with administrators and parents and teachers and can't, everybody knows what's going on. So Vivian, it's back to you. So prior to being a, a full professor in a university setting, I was actually a preschool and elementary school teacher for 14 years and it was do, while doing coursework at um, MSVU, um, in, which is in Nova Scotia, that I first met Barbara Comer and learned of Jenny, Jenny O'Brien's work and, you know, the scholarship of Alan Luke and became more and more interested in Carol Edelsky's work and, and so forth. And I immediately was very attracted to their social justice orientation with critical literacy. And um, I know that, you know, a lot of my own attraction came from my own painful memories of, um, you know, growing up in public school settings as an immigrant child from the Philippines. So my work in critical literacy was always focused on children's issues, interests, questions, and observations. And, you know, a lot of these issues were really um, centered on race, class, gender, and so forth, and dealt with notions of power and control. A lot of you probably are familiar with some of my work on the audit trail, so I won't say too much here because I know we're also running out of time, but so I'll just say a little bit about um, the next couple of slides. Um, I started off, this was a junior kindergarten classroom, and I started off the year just really wanting to find the text that I thought the children could engage with right away. And so I, you know, looked for a pattern kind of book. This was, you know, a classroom with three to five-year-olds. and decided to start with Quick as Cricket. So I started reading the book. This is the first day of class. And, you know, the book goes, I'm as quick as a cricket. I'm as cold as a. Uh, and this image that you see on the right was the image that, that appeared. And so right away the question was raised, is that a frog or a toad? So I said to the children, well, how do we find out? How can we find out? So we went to the library. We got all kinds of books. We started looking through all of these books and these magazines to try and, you know, think about, was well, this a frog or is this a toad? And while they were doing that, I mean, they ran into all of these issues around, you know, the rainforest. And so a group then started to become very interested in environmental issues. So there was our first inquiry project in this sort of environmental issues. But while they were exploring environmental issues, they ran into one book where the forest needs to see where there was an image of a man cooking over an open fire. And then the question was raised, well, why is it a man cooking over an open fire? Shouldn't that be a woman? because women cook, men don't. So that started a whole other conversation around gender um, issues. So now we've got, you know, environmental issues, gender issues, and all from the very first conversation that we had in this classroom for three to five-year-olds. Now, at the same time, I had been very interested in the work done by the, the teachers in Reggio Emilia, Italy, and the kind of documentation of children's learning that they were doing. And I thought, you know, this is just, how can I use the kind of documentation that these teachers are doing to um, help me to, to, um, to make visible to my students, to their parents, to other teachers, the critical work that we were doing. So what I decided to do was to sort of this, this was born, this idea of an audit trail. What I did to begin with um, was to think about, well, what are some artifacts that might best represent the conversation that we were having based on this book, Quick as a Cricket. So what I did was I posted um, the cover of the, the book jacket, and then I posted the image that first led to the question of, or, you know, is this a frog or a toad, and the question itself. So I posted that on, on the bulletin board and then talked to the children about that to say that, you know, now what I've done here is to try and think about what I thought would best represent, remind us of this conversation, this work that we're doing around environmental issues and gender issues, and these are the artifacts I chose. Now, from now on, what I want us to think about is, you know, what are some different things that we could post on this wall that would remind us of different things that we'd be doing in, in the future? And so we brainstormed all kinds of possibilities. And this, what you're seeing here on this slide, is just the very beginning section of this audit trail. I mean, this is a huge, um, huge, um, they cover the entire one wall of my classroom by the end of that year. So what happened here, let me just show you a couple of images. So I mean here we, we, we unpacked and then unpacked um, McDonald's Happy Meals, which is why you see a Happy Meal posted there. So all of these different issues were different issues 
that came up and, and you know, throughout the year. The arrows that you're seeing there are arrows that connect various issues together. So, you know, the more that we posted artifacts representing the things that we were learning about, the more we saw sort of commonalities and connections between those different issues, those different studies. So we started to join together those those different projects and issues and topics using different color arrows. So for instance, we discovered that, you know, we had been doing a lot of stuff dealing with gender. So we strung all of those together using, you know, orange arrows. And then um, issues dealing with commercialization, with consumerism, we joined all of those together using red arrows and so forth and so on. So it became very visible for the children. And as we constructed the audit trail, then um, I began to think about using it as a tool for, for sort of these critical conversations with young children. And by the end of the school year, the audit trail had become really a joint construction between myself and my students and a means of generating and reflecting on the classroom curriculum. Each of the artifacts then became a way for us to make visible the incidents that caused us to want to learn the issues we had critical conversations about and the action we took to resist being dominated and to reposition ourselves within our community. So these then became our demonstration of and also really our site for constructing critical curriculum for ourselves. So this audit trail, this learning wall became a powerful articulation of the generativeness of a critical inquiry curriculum and a reminder of what happens when young people are given opportunities to interrogate and research things that matter in their lives, that have importance in their lives. And by the end of the school year, we had assembled a repertoire of language and literacy practices that really surpassed the mandated curriculum, including, you know, petition writing, letter writing, surveys, public speaking, and this is with a classroom of three to five year olds. So, and if you want more information on, on, on this, feel free to um, go to my website. They were posted at the one of the beginning slides, and I think you'll have access to that later on. Or you could email also, and I'll, I'm happy to share more with you. But for now, I'll just pass it on back to Jerry. Thank you, Vivian. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to move us ahead here. Um, because I'm getting just a little worried about uh, our time. And one of the things that I wanted to show them uh, is this particular uh, look at what literacy in the next generation might look like. This is a videotape by Mike Mathis. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, but I, I think it's an interesting little piece about the directions in which uh, uh, 21st century literacy is going. So I, I thought we'd play that and probably we can open that up then for conversation. So here's the video. Uh, everybody, this is Peggy. I'm going to go ahead and play this. Some of you may be able to see it and on, see it and hear it, and some of you may only be able to hear it, but we're going to go f try it. How do we stop this? Do you want to be a publisher, a, a technology licensor? What is the business here? Is this something that... Okay, I stopped it.
back. And uh, um, I think one of the reasons why we wanted to sort of play that at the end was that I think it gives us a look into the future of literacy a little bit. And I think when you look at these kinds of things, there's a lot to think about. In some ways, the old notion of uh, you know learning to sound out words doesn't seem so relevant anymore. Uh, these new texts, the kids can have them read to them. They're very interactive. They can do research. I also think there's a little danger in these new texts in that there's a lot of stuff that's on the web that really needs uh, to be interrogated. Um, and I think uh, it's uh, um, it's interesting to think about the possibilities that are out there and the kinds of uh, skills that our kids are coming with and the kinds of attitudes that allow this kind of uh, technology to really uh, take off. Um, but I, I don't think, it, I think the new literacies are also made up of the old literacies and I think we have to be uh, pretty cognizant of that. Peggy, can you show that uh, little videotape of the power of words? Is that working? I'm not seeing this. Like, uh, we might have a little bit of trouble playing this. I'm trying to uh, do the best we can with this video. I've yeah, put the, put um, the YouTube, YouTube website, website so, so that's a possibility, that's a possibility of, looking of looking at that. At that. But I'm going to yeah. go ahead and continue to play it for those who can see it. Is that OK? Can some of you see it anyway? Will you give me a little smiley face? OK. So now the timer's timed out. What does that mean? Are we are we done? We can't talk anymore. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can all hear you, Jerry. Yeah, Go ahead. You, Jerry. Go ahead. Ah, well, I I don't know if they saw this video, but in this video, there's this uh, blind guy who's saying he's blind and he wants money, and he gets some money. But then a lady comes by and she takes away his sign and she writes on there. Uh, it's a beautiful day. I wish I could see it. And he gets all kinds of contributions. And I guess what I really liked about that particular video, video in, especially in conjunction with the other one, is that it reminds us that uh, you know the old, the new literacies are part, or the old literacies are part of the new literacies. And words still do matter. And how we put together words, how we say what we mean, how we interrogate. Uh, and understand the systems of meaning position that's very differently in the world. And I think in combination, those two videos really talk to us about the kinds of work that we've got ahead of us in terms of uh, becoming literate beings to the 21st century. Vivian, I'll turn it over to you and you can say some final, you can give the benediction. Benediction. Yeah, I can't. Okay. <laughs> Yay, last word for me. All right, so I think just, you know, as a last word, oh, video is playing.
stopped and now it's stopped again. Just for us to always think about that, you know, regardless of the kinds of literacy, critical literacies that we take up in different settings, regardless of what those critical literacies might sound like, look like, whether or not they involve the use of technology or not, that the project remains the same. And that is, you know, we need to continuously work on understanding the relationship between text, meaning making, and power to undertake transformative social action that contributes to a more just society. So thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining us this evening. Thanks, indeed.